In this PowerPoint, um, which in class we'll look at over two or three classes, it's fairly long, we're looking at government intervention in the marketplace. And as you can see from the photo with the umbrella, uh, the government is trying to protect um, different members of society, whether they are consumers or producers. First, we'll start with price controls, and they're usually enacted when policymakers believe that the market price of a good or service is unfair to either buyers or sellers. So examples could include rent control laws, where they dictate a maximum rent that landlords may charge tenants, and this would be protecting um, the consumer from rents being too high, or minimum wage laws dictating the lowest wage that firms may pay workers, so hopefully to, um, to protect the workers and, and uh, enable them to, to earn a, a decent or more decent wage. We have a fundamental conflict between buyers and sellers. Buyers want the lowest price they can pay, and of course sellers want the highest price they can receive. A price ceiling. It's a legal maximum on the price which a good can be sold. If the price ceiling is above the market price or the market equilibrium price, then it's not binding. We'll, we'll see this in a, in a moment. Market forces will always naturally move the economy to the equilibrium and the price ceiling will have no effect. So if the market can get to the equilibrium, it will try to do so. Only if the, uh, the ceiling or the floor is binding would that prevent that from happening. So here's an example of a price ceiling that has no effect. So if we put up here the price ceiling, now with the price ceiling it means that we can't charge anything more because you can think that's the ceiling that's as high as you can, but you can charge less if you wanted to. And because the market equilibrium price is possible to be attained, that's the one that will prevail. And so in this case the price ceiling is going to have absolutely no effect. So a price ceiling is a legal maximum on the price which a good can be sold. If the price ceiling is below the equilibrium price, the ceiling is, bind, is a binding constraint on the market. And we'll see this in a moment. So a price ceiling that is binding. So once again, the price ceiling is the maximum. We could charge less if we wanted to, but there really would be no reason to. Can we get to the equilibrium price? No, because we can't go any higher than the price ceiling. So with the price at the price ceiling, we want to see where it intersects the supply and demand curve. So here it is intersecting the supply curve. I'm going to bring this down and call this QS. Here it is intersecting the demand curve bring this down and call it QD. Because we have a greater quantity demanded than we have quantity supplied, we have a shortage. So here it is drawn for you. Um, here's the price, seal, the price ceiling here. We cannot get to the equilibrium because we can't go any higher than the price ceiling. And here is the shortage. A price floor. A price floor is a legal minimum that the price can be sold. And we will return to this concept later in the slides. So for a price <coughs> excuse me, floor to be binding, it would need to be up here. With a price floor, we can charge more, but we can't go below the floor, so we cannot get to the equilibrium. Again, we're going to look at where it intersects supply and demand. Don't memorize this, just in terms of whether it creates a shortage or sur um, surplus. Just quickly um, sketch what's happening and figure out what's happening. So here it's intersecting the demand curve, so this must be QD. Here the price is intersecting the supply curve, so this must be QS. We have more supplied than demanded, so we must have a surplus. 
but we will talk about this further later on in the presentation. So this is going to be a, um, really a, a rather ridiculous example, <clears throat> but it will um, help to prove the point of what's happening with a, uh, a price ceiling. So think that there's a price ceiling on toilet paper. So suppose that legislation was passed that placed a 10% price ceiling on each roll of toilet paper. And note this price is approximately 80% below the fair market price. What can we learn from this? Will there be more or less toilet paper for sale? The law of demand tells us that if the price drops, consumers' quantity demanded will increase, so people will want more toilet paper. But at the same time, according to the law of supply, the quantity supplied will fall because producers are receiving lower profits for their efforts. And as we saw in a previous slide, we're then going to have a shortage. Well, so sorry, I already said that. So will this cause a shortage or surplus? There, the result will be a shortage of toilet paper because the quantity demanded will exceed the quantity supplied at below the market price of 10 cents. Will the size of a typical roll increase or decrease? Producers can maintain their profits by reducing the size of each roll they produce. Will the quality rise or fall? Producers can also lower the quality of their product by using cheaper ingredients and giving up production of fancier varieties. Are there other ways for firms to avoid the law? Firms will try to relabel their product to get around the price ceiling. So we could see here, it could almost be used as a decorative or almost wedding-like um, display. Um, perhaps they would relabel it as something that you can remove uh, makeup with or anything other than labeling it as toilet paper to try and get around this law. Will the opportunity cost of finding to toilet paper rise or fall? And we can see in the lower right hand corner, uh, tremendous lineup. Um, this is probably from the depression, but in a silly example like this, perhaps they're, they're waiting to buy toilet paper. So rolls of toilet paper will become harder to find, smaller and generally of lower quality. However, there's more to consider. What happens to the opportunity cost of finding toilet paper? Since toilet paper is hard to find, people who want toilet paper will have to wait in line to try and get it. Would you buy illegally produced toilet paper? Informal markets will develop to help supply meet demand. Many who do not want to wait in line or who do not succeed in obtaining toilet paper despite waiting in line will resort to illegal means to obtain it. Sellers will go underground, charge higher prices and deliver customers the toilet paper they want without all the hassle much like alcoholic beverages under prohibition in the 1920s. Who are the winners and losers? Winners are producers in the informal market, consumers with good connections and enough income to afford normal toilet paper, and losers are domestic producers and consumers. So what mechanisms might exist for rationing goods when a shortage exists? Long lines, which is inefficient. Sellers might ration goods according to their personal biases. We could have discrimination. It could also be inefficient because it does not go to the buyer who values it most and is potentially unfair. Free markets, we know, ration goods with prices. So the consequences of a price ceilings, smaller quantities supplied and sold, under allocation of resources to the good and failure to receive allocative efficiency, non-price rationing, and underground or informal markets. Why might policymakers want to adopt rent control for a city? Rent controls impose a maximum price for rents and are a form of price ceilings. Now, I'm not sure with, um, with doing a PowerPoint mix if you're going to be able to see the next video, 
But if you can, um, please watch that because that raises a number of um, important issues for rent control. And then we'll resume with the voiceover. Hello, Manhattan Apartments. I have called every realtor in the entire city. That's everything the else that I saw yeah. was horrible. It doesn't even have a sink. Finding a place to live is always tense. But in many places, politicians have done something that makes it tougher. Normally, when you rent an apartment or house, it costs what it costs because of simple supply and demand. When demand is high, investors see a chance to make a profit. They build more housing. Then supply increases, runs ahead of demand, and prices come back down. The result is affordable housing. That's how it usually works. But in some 200 American cities, politicians, to protect poor people, passed laws that control rents, limit increases. But it so often happens, laws that try to protect us from cruelties of the market have unintended side effects. Look at what's happened here in the city where I live. This is some of New York's most valuable real estate. Does this look like an area that needs to be protected from market cruelties? If you could find a Fifth Avenue apartment on a floor this high with this spectacular view, the rent would be more than $10,000 a month. Alistair Cook has this view. Remember him from Masterpiece Theater? Good evening. I'm Alistair Cook. Cook lives at a large apartment on the top floor of this building. But he doesn't pay the $10,000 a month you'd have to pay. He pays less than a fifth that. Wouldn't you like to pay less than a fifth of your rent or your mortgage? Cook pays less because he scored. He was lucky enough to live in this fashionable building at a time when politicians to help poor people regulated the rents. I think he's a thief. Economist Walter Williams. A thief? Just yes, he's, us he's using government to take what belongs to one person and give it to him. That is, if there were no rent control, he would have to pay the market price. But he's not paying the market price. But he's not breaking any laws. But laws don't establish morality. Now, Cook didn't ask for any special breaks. The system just gives it. Remember the Mayflower Madam? Sidney Biddle Barrows made lots of money running a brothel. She pays about half what you'd have to pay for her apartment. Lots of politicians, rich businessmen, and celebrities benefit from rent controls met for the poor. We usually only find out about them after they've been exposed. Supermodel Kim Alexis lived under rent protection. So did singer Carly Simon and fashion designer Arnold Scazzi. When he put his apartment in Architectural Digest, he didn't mention he was getting a rent break meant for the needy. We've been trying for weeks to get inside a wealthy person's rent-controlled apartment with our cameras, but it's virtually impossible. People just laughed and said, no way. But we can show you Mia Farrow's old rent-controlled apartment because Woody Allen shot the movie Hannah and Her Sisters here. The rent? A third of what you and I would have to pay in the open market. It's bad enough that controls let rich insiders get special deals, but the bigger unintended consequence of the laws is that houses and apartments left on the free market cost more. Newcomers pay inflated rents because cities with rent control tend to have less housing. Where there's rent control, landlords don't want to build. In unregulated cities like Dallas and Chicago, lots of apartments are available. But in rent-controlled cities like New York, you may have to bribe someone to get an apartment. You can pay brokers under the table sometimes, which, which helps. But we would never do that. I would never do that. Finally, the most destructive unintended consequence of rent controls is that some landlords say, if I can't raise the rent, I won't make repairs. And they don't. Short of aerial bombardment, the best way to destroy a city is through rent controls. Rent control is a big reason many landlords abandon their buildings, just walk away from their investment. You see acres of it here in New York. All this has led some opinion makers to have doubts and led some politicians to question the wisdom of what they had done. Two years ago, Massachusetts decided to end rent control. People are building housing now in Boston for the first time in 20 years. Author William Tucker, who wrote this book about housing policy, says it turned out that only 6% of the people getting rent protection in Massachusetts were poor. Those people are now getting subsidies. It would be a very easy thing to subsidize all the people in any city that need a little help in paying their rent. But instead, you impose this blanket system that ruins the housing market, benefits all kinds of people who don't need it, and then you say, oh, we've got a housing crisis. 
And that's what we have in New York City and in other places where rents are still protected. While the privileged, the insiders, those who know how to work the system, get to freeload. And that's how it usually works. Case study, rent control in the short run and in the long run. The short run supply and demand for housing are relatively inelastic. Two reasons for this. Landlords have a fixed number of apartments to rent and two people take time to adjust their housing arrangements. The impact of rent control in the short run. So we see that supply is perfectly inelastic. There's only so many units available for rent. We have a demand curve that is, um, isn't terribly steep. And we see that this is QS and this is QD at the price ceiling um, price. And so we have demand exceeding, the quantity demanded exceeding quantity supplied. And so we have a shortage of rental units. With a price ceiling, the resulting effect is a shortage. Because demand and supply are relatively inel sorry, inelastic, the shortage is relatively small in the short run. The primary effect in the short run is to reduce rents. But impact of rent control in the long run, where supply and demand become more elastic, the reason suppliers become more elastic, or excuse me, I shouldn't say suppliers, the reason that um, price elasticity of supply becomes more elastic is because landlords have time to um, convert their rentals to condos, perhaps rip down buildings, convert them to uh, maybe retail um, operations and so on. And in terms of why does price elasticity of demand become more elastic, people um, with lower rents may decide to move into the city from the countryside. They may decide to uh, not live with their parents anymore and come downtown and a host of reasons. So again, at the price ceiling, we see where it intersects, inter intercepts supply, we call this QS. We see where it intercepts demand, we call this QD. And this whole difference now where quantity demanded exceeds quantity supplied is a much larger shortage. So a long run response to rent control. So landlords may stop building new apartments and not maintain old ones. Low rents may encourage people to seek out rental units rather than living at home, or they may also now move into the city. And so the net result, as we discussed, is a larger shortage in the long run. And also in an attempt to circumvent rent control, gentrification can occur. So this happens, I know it happens in Toronto, in order to um, avoid being under rent control anymore, landlords can undergo substantial renovations. And then the argument is, is that the um, is that the improved units are so radically different from, from the old structure that they're no longer bound by rent control and can hike up the rent substantially. So what might be the effect of rationing apartments? We saw this in our silly example of toilet paper, but it's relevant for this too. We could have long waiting lists. Preference could be given to people, for instance, without children. There could be bribes or key money, which is illegal in Ontario. So it's money under the table, bringing the price closer to the equilibrium price. There could be different forms of discrimination. But the net result of rent control, in essence, is lower rents and lower quality housing. So attempts to counteract rationing techniques. We could have laws against racial discrimination, laws for minimum living conditions, but they're difficult and costly to enforce. Now we're going to look at price floors. Once again, it's not going to be binding if it's below the equilibrium price. Binding if above the equilibrium price and will result in a surplus. So if this is the price floor, Number one, with a floor, you can charge more, but there'd be no reason to charge more. You cannot charge less, so you cannot get to the equilibrium. So this would be binding. Again, we're going to see where it intercepts demand and supply. So here it's intercepting demand. So we'll bring this down and call this QD. 
Here it's intercepting supply, bring it down, call it QS. Quantity supplied exceeds quantity demanded, so we have a surplus. And here it is drawn. Here's the price floor. We cannot get to the equilibrium because we, we can charge more but not less. And there is the surplus. Consequences of price floors. As we saw from the diagram, we're going to have surpluses. We're going to have a smaller quantity demanded because um, the price has increased from the equilibrium. And of course, according to the law of demand, as price increases, quantity demanded will decrease. So we have a smaller quantity demanded and purchased. We have firm inefficiency because we have more inefficient firms being able to produce because they're being rewarded with a higher price. We have over allocation of resources to the production of the good because we know quantity supplied has gone up in response to the higher price. And we can have illegal sales at prices below the floor because producers will be left with surpluses wondering what to do with it. And so it's better from their perspective to try and sell, sell it off even at a lower price rather than just holding on to it and getting nothing for it. So an example of minimum wage. So if we look to the effect of a non-binding minimum wage, if the price floor was here, so remember with a floor, you can't charge less, but you can charge more. Can you get to the equilibrium? The answer is yes. And so that's the price that will prevail and the price floor will have absolutely no effect. Here's one, uh, the effect of a binding minimum wage. So note, with, um, with a labor um, demand and supply diagram, instead of price, we're saying wage. For quantity, we're dealing with quantity of labor. And this is a little bit um, of a different perspective. When we're looking at demand, we're looking at labor demand. Now that means the demand by firms to hire people. When we look at labor supply, that's actually you and I offering our labor. So we usually um, associate demand with consumers, but here it's firms demanding labor. We normally um, identify supply as firms, but here it's you and I offering our labor. So here is the um, minimum wage. So we cannot charge less, so we cannot uh, get to the equilibrium. Let's look at what's going on here. This is intersecting with demand. So this is quantity demanded for labor. This is the quantity supplied of labor. So we have, as we know, is a surplus. But in this, we could either identify this below or above up here. A surplus of labor, we're going to call in this market unemployment. What can be the impact of a minimum wage? Well, we can have a surplus of labor as we saw on the graph. There is an increase of wage for those lucky enough who are working. It's an increase in the cost of production, a decrease in the quantity of labor employed because the price has gone up. Uh, firms will employ less labor because their costs of production have gone up. We have an increase in unemployment and there's um, always the risk of possible illegal employment, which is under the table being paid in cash at a lower rate. The impact of a minimum wage. It depends on skill and experience of the worker. Workers, excuse me, with high skill level and much experience are not affected because their wage rate is well above the minimum wage level. So think of doctors, accountants, uh, management, and so on. They're really not impacted if minimum wage goes up because their, their wages are so substantially higher. The greatest impact on the market is for teenage labor. We have low skills and inexperienced. Plus teenagers are willing to receive lower wages in return for on-the-job training. So minimum wage legislation tends to increase the number of teenagers 
students um, who work or who want to work. So the teenagers see the larger um, wage and they say, well, hmm, I'll, I, I'm very interested in that and I'd like to try and get into the employment market if I could. So now we're going to look at price floors to support farmers' incomes. One way that governments support farmers' incomes is by setting price floors for certain key agricultural products. It may also be known as a buffer stock. So an agricultural product with a price floor. So we'll put the price floor up here. Again, this is QD. This is QS. This is a surplus. Now, what often happens if the government is trying to help farmers by having a, um, a higher price, we know that this quantity up to QD at this price will be purchased by consumers. But their quantity has been reduced um, from their equilibrium quantity, which was here, QE, to QD. So that wouldn't necessarily help farmers at all. So this first rectangle that we see um, is being purchased, as I said, in the market. Now they're left with a surplus. Depending on, on what the, um, the good is, it might rot, it might have a short shelf life. Um, but at any rate, it's not particularly helping the farmers by having it sit there. So the government often promises to pay to buy up all of this. I'm going to call it buffer stock, thereby giving um, the uh, the farmers more income. So they get income in two tranches: one from consumers, and then again from the government. So the impacts of price floor on agricultural goods. There's a surplus of goods, as I said, often bought by the government. The farmer's revenue increases. Consumers are worf, worse off because of the higher prices and then less goods because their quantity demanded has gone down. It does encourage inefficient production because we have producers that couldn't produce at the lower price now able to join the market because they can meet um, the, their costs with the higher price. It's a significant cost to the government in taxes to buy up that buffer stock and we might have over allocation of resources to production. So we could have allocative inefficiency. And we have a global misallocation of agricultural resources. So how can a price floor lead to increased um, farmers revenue? Okay, well the farmers revenue, I'll try to do this in different colors if the program allows me. The farmers revenue before is this. With a price floor, we have, once again, this will be QD, this will be QS, this will be the surplus, We will have the government buying up, let me just try to get another color again, it's being stubborn. Government buying up all of this, plus we'll have the consumers buying up all of this. So uh, I know it's a little bit messy, but we can see that um, that the, um, the farmer's revenue has increased quite substantially. So alternative policies to price controls. We could look at rent and wage subsidies, but they're going to require higher taxes. But it, in, uh, in, in some ways, these are, it can be more favorable. So subsidies, you need to know this definition well. A subsidy is a payment made to firms or consumers designed to encourage an increase in output. 
a subsidy will sh shift the supply curve to the right. It's actually down by the amount of the subsidy. It's going to look like it shifts right, but it's actually shifting down by the amount of the subsidy. And therefore, um, lowers the equilibrium price in a market. A subsidy to firms is intended to lower the costs of production. So let's look at example of a subsidy given to cotton producers. Again, I'll try to change the color of the ink. Just give me a minute. Okay. So here we have the supply curve. We could say it's shifting right. S1 and S with subsidy. But technically what's happening is that it's shifting down by the amount of the per unit subsidy. So let's say if this subsidy was $10, this would be a shift down of $10. Um, before I go any further, let me just identify this as this was the original equilibrium price and quantity. Okay, now with the subsidy, we have a new intersection of the new curve with the subsidy and the demand curve. Now you'll hear me say this with both subsidies and with taxes. From this new equilibrium point, I need to create a rectangle to represent the amount of the subsidy. I can't particularly go down because nothing interesting happens. I just hit the x-axis or the quantity axis. But if I go up, here I can create my rectangle and bring this across. Now what happens is this becomes the price consumers pay. This becomes the pr overall price that producers receive. In terms of the quantity, this now becomes the quantity with the subsidy. So note what happens. The quantity increases. Consumers from the equilibrium price get to pay less, but the producers compared to the old equilibrium price receive more. Now, how can that be? What ends up happening is that we know that this is the amount of the subsidy. It's parallel to this line here. This is the amount that we're selling. So all of this becomes the total subsidy. So what ends up happening at the end of the day when um, the producers uh, get their money is they get PC from the consumers at a quantity of Q2. So they get all of, all of that bottom rectangle. And then at, let's say the end of the month, once they've reported to the government how much they've sold, the government then gives them a check for the total subsidy box. So they get paid in two tranches. So here is um, a graph for you. Here's the original equilibrium price, the original equilibrium quantity. The supply curve has shifted down by the amount of the subsidy. We have our new equilibrium, which is here. We need to create our rectangular box. We can't go down, nothing interesting will happen. So we go up until we hit the new supply curve and create our total subsidy box. And then once again, the farmer will be paid in two goes. One, the price that the consumers pay at this new quantity because consumers will demand more because the price has dropped for them from PE to PC. And then they will get a check from the government for the total subsidy, the yellow box, in the mail, perhaps a month later. So you practice drawing the subsidy and see if you can replicate what's happened.
the effects of the subsidy. So for consumers, we know that price went down. We know that quantity demanded went up. So they're better off. For producers, we know that their price received went up because they get the additional money from the government. We know that their quantity supplied went up. So we know their total revenue went up. So they're happy. So, so far, sounds absolutely ideal. But for the government and taxpayer, they have to pay for the subsidy. So if we compare and contrast rent control versus subsidies. So let's first look at rent control. We'll look at subsidies over here. We know that QD goes up but QS goes down, so we have a shortage, and the shortage is long, larger in the long run. So rent control can be great if you're one of those lucky people who managed to get the rent control units at the lower rent, but we're going to have all those people who are without rental units. We also know that there's going to be a problem with um, maintenance, might go down. Um, the, the problem of long lines, we might have discrimination, etc. So all sorts of problems. With subsidies, we know that QD goes up and QS goes up, so there are more units. We know, oh, and I'm sorry, with rent control, I forgot to mention that, yes, indeed, price does go down. Price does go down, um, but so we have more units available. But the downside, of course, is the fact that the taxpayer and government must pay for the subsidy. Now, also, there's, there's another um, perspective to look at. If rent control is being enacted because it's viewed as sort of a social policy and, and trying to help um, the low-income families, in terms of equity, is it really fair to be targeting landlords in a situation of rent control and making them, in essence, foot the bill for the social problem? It's the landlord's income that goes down. Landlords often end up exiting the, uh, the industry, so they've lost their livelihood. Their revenue has gone down. Um, is, is that really uh, you know, particularly equitable to target um, one segment of society to try and fix the, the social issue? So at least you know, something to think about. Commodity agreements and buffer stock schemes. So a commodity is a standardized product and usually refers to a good that's produced in the primary sector. So examples could be cotton, um, could be um, copper, coffee, etc. Commodity agreements are agreements that are attempting to increase or stabilize global price of commodities. So I've already made reference to buffer stock schemes where there are a special type of commodity agreement intended to limit price fluctuations. So examples for cocoa, coffee, rubber, and sugar. And another type of commodity agreement involves setting export quotas, which attempt to limit the quantity of exports and therefore increase price. So examples could be sugar and coffee. So what happens to price when there's a really good growing season? Okay, so we know, and we also know that demand and supply for commodities tends to be inelastic. So we're going to have the supply curve increase to S2. We're going to have, this is PE, this is QE. So this becomes Q2 and P2. 
If you can compare and contrast the two revenue boxes of before and after, I would show you with color, but um, unfortunately the program doesn't let me switch back and forth fast enough. We're going to see that total revenue, it goes down, but we're asked to focus on price. We can see that the price has quite a, a big change compared to the change in quantity. So price fluctuates a lot. Let's see if there's a poor growing season. Again, we'll focus on price. So here we've got PE, QE, and up here we've got P2 and Q2. So relative to the change in price, again, we've got price changes a lot. So the government might feel now that the price is too high for consumers and too great a burden. And in the previous slide, when we had a good growing season and price went down, government might feel that the price is too low for the farmers to be able to have a decent standard of living. So at any rate, um, be because how it affects consumers and, and farmers, it is not a good idea for an economy for the price of things that you're really relying on, so agricultural goods and food, to be fluctuating madly. Um, that's very unstable for both the consumers, and particularly low-income consumers, and the producers of those goods. So if the government decides to implement a buffer stock scheme to stabilize prices, the government will determine a price at which it would like the product to sell, and we can call this a target price. So if the supply is high and the price is too low, so the equilibrium price right now, let's say they've had a really good growing season, the price has really plummeted, um, and, 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 um, and the price is too low. So at the target price, so let's put this up here and call this target price, there results a surplus because this is QD, this is QS, this is the surplus. And so what happens is that the government under this agrees to buy up the buffer stock and put it in storage. When the supply is low, when we know the prices have then um, gone up considerably and um, prices are high, then the target price might be down here below the equilibrium. Again, looking at this, this would be QS, QD, and we have a shortage. So in order to, um, prevent, to, to deal with this shortage, the authorities now sell this quantity from their buffer stocks that they have kept in storage, and this keeps the price from rising due to the shortage. But the problems with buffer stocks, there's a high cost of storage, there can be underfunding of the schemes. Um, you have to be able to predict future prices. There's a need to balance surpluses with shortages over several years, which may not match each other. You might run out of stocks during times of rising prices. And there's an overall an inability to address the problem of declining prices over the long run. So just lastly, let's look at the incidence of subsidies on consumers and producers. Um, and we're going to look at when demand uh, in this case is more inelastic. So see the demand curve is quite steep and the supply curve is relatively flatter. So we're going to again shift S to S with subsidy. Let's put this S up here. S with subsidy. Just like before we look at where the new supply curve meets the old demand curve. And we want to create that rectangular box. This is PE. This should be down here. This is the price that producers receive. This is the price that consumers pay. So who has the biggest benefit? Well, we can see that consumers really had quite a reduced price compared to the tiny increase in price that the producers receive. So consumers benefited more.
or benefited the most. So we had demand being inelastic, affecting the consumers the most. Let's look at supply being inelastic. So it's relatively steep. Demand is relatively flat. Again, let's put the subsidy on. So S with subsidy. Let's look at the new point of intersection. Create a rectangular box. We can't go down, so we're going to go up. Bring it across. Bring it across. This is the price consumers pay the price producers receive, and we can see that now it's the producers have the greatest benefit. And so this is when supply is more inelastic. So conclusion, the more inelastic party or curve has the greatest benefit. And while we haven't done this with taxation yet, uh, what we will see is that we'll just put it in generic terms because one's a benefit for subsidies and the other one is is something that's not desirable when it's taxes. So we're going to say the more inelastic party has the greatest effect. And we'll revisit this when we do taxation. Thank you.